One of the most um, handy uh, hand tools that you're going to find in your workshop is the Dremel rotary tool. Um, taking good care of that lasts a very long time. This is a variable speed Dremel tool that I've had for years and years. And um, you always want to remember safety. You always want to wear a protective face shield when you're doing this in case uh, any of the tools should come apart or uh, anything you're working on should uh, splinter. Um, just as an example, we have these little uh, barrels that you can use that are kind of like little sandpaper barrels. And they're great. Uh, you put them in there and tighten up the chuck. Um, this is a finger chuck, so you don't have to have the key, the chuck key. And you might use it to take off a burr or a high spot in the wood. This is a, a profile for a uh, leading edge on, on a plane. Um, a more recent um, addition to the Dremel are these coarse uh, brushes. They're kind of like um, sandpaper on a wheel, uh, but they're flexible and they're terrific. Um, you can buy them uh, in different uh, coarseness. Uh, it's like 180 and 320. The two different colors, brown and black. And once again, it's a terrific tool for uh, removing any uh, marks or uh, making a channel or, or uh, cut area a little bit deeper and smoothing out any marks that you might have from your router. They're really, really handy. Um, the last tool that we use frequently is a cutoff disc. You definitely want to shield. These tend to fracture and can come back. Um, and this is used often in cutting off steel piano wire. You'll be working on the wing and you'll have your drag anti-drag wires within the wing structure and um, you'll use this uh, tool to uh, cut the wire uh, right at the length that you want. It's really handy. Another set of tools that you can't do without in woodworking planes is clamps. And the interesting thing is not all clamps are made the same. Uh, it may sound silly, but these are some that I really, really like. Um, they expand to the width that you need, so it's really nice. You can grab something in between, especially like if you're holding down a plywood on a spar or something. Uh, and it, it's variable width. The only thing I don't like is because these tend to uh, swivel on you, uh, it can slide off. So I often just um, hot glue these closed, you know, in one position so that they don't move on me. Now we have here two uh, spring clamps and two different types. And what I found was that this particular brand uh, is very helpful for uh, some applications, but it's actually the spring is too tight. And, and so it kind of crushes the wood and leaves a mark. And uh, so you can see it, it's quite an effort to squeeze that. And I found these uh, through Micromark, and their name and number will be available at the end of the DVD. And I found that they're terrific. They're much lighter. Um, the frame, they're not as sturdy, but they have just the right amount of pressure. Um, the only drawback is that these little rubber boots tend to wear off. So get yourself some of the liquid uh, handle material like this stuff and you can dip them yourself and uh, let that dry and you'll get the same kind of protection and it actually stays on a lot better than these little boots. And finally, these miniature ones. These things are invaluable. I use them all the time when I'm building uh, ribs on a rib jig. They're perfect for holding quarter by quarter, quarter by three eighths and they're available through Micromark. One of the things you want to consider when you're building an airplane, of course, is the grade of the wood. Um, we all know you can't go down to your local lumber yard and buy a piece of wood and start building an airplane out of it if it's going to be uh, licensed experimental. What we have here are how we get our wood. We buy our wood from a number of select lumber mills uh, who sell wholesale only, so they have large, they require large quantity orders in the neighborhood of six to eight hundred board feet. A board foot is one inch deep by 12 inches by 12 inches. So this piece is probably just under a foot and it's uh, called, um, it's one inch is called four quarters, so two inches is called eight quarters. So this is roughly an eight quarter piece of wood. Um, these are some spars in, that we've uh, started to finish for one of our airplanes and um, they're eight quarter by nine quarter. So um, you have two inches by um, about two and a quarter, a little bit more. Um, you can see the wood uh, here. Each, each piece is called a flitch, and the flitch is here are over 20 feet long. They come different board lengths, but generally um, you're looking at, you know, if you're going to make spars or lawn drawings, you need 20, roughly 20 foot long pieces. Um, generally, 
uh, you know, wood is cut one season uh, in British Columbia or Alaska, and then it's shipped uh, to a lumber yard as logs, and then they're going to grade it in their yard, and uh, they're going to, you know, if you have a salesman that you deal with, they're going to tell you what they have based on what they've graded for that season, and then uh, eventually they're going to put it in a kiln and dry it to specific uh, uh, moisture content, and then they'll tell you, you know, what they can deliver uh, out of that. Now, there's a lot of information about wood that we're going to share uh, in some of the uh, printed material that you'll see here in the video. Um, but um, you have to buy quarter sawn wood. And that is a very small portion of the log generally and how it's cut. And you'll see in the diagram that we're going to show you uh, what portion of each log that is. But as you can see, the grain here is almost running vertical in each one of these pieces. Um, there's the question of what is, uh, you know, uh, adequate number of growth rings, tree rings per inch. Um, uh, I like to look for, and I, you know, order 10 to 12, that's what I like to get, 10 to 12 uh, growth rings per inch. And we'll take a closer look at a sample in just a minute. But I just wanted you to see how the wood comes in. These pieces, each one takes two men to lift. Uh, we cut it here on the bandsaw. If I have to make a deep cut, my bandsaw is not set up for that, so I go to a sawmill and we do uh, a cut uh, on a commercial uh, recutting saw and then we bring it back. Um, these pieces here, um, you see, um, are rough cut. Um, they're finished four sides, ends rough. Um, they're for our Curtis Jenny and they're the ailerons. They're 11 feet long. And then over here, I have an order from a guy um, who wanted some spar material for uh, an EAA Pober Pixie. So there's a, uh, pieces that we've cut and they're roughly 17 feet long. So now we're going to take a look at some other examples of wood and close up and some of the defects you want to avoid. Um, now that we've looked at some of the rough cut wood, I'd like to show you some examples of things to look for. Um, their flaws or uh, characteristics that you want to be aware of. Um, on the table here, we just have some samples of wood. Um, the ones furthest from us are both spruce, stick of spruce, and the ones closest to us are um, ash. Um, we use ash a lot on um, World War I era up till 1920s airplanes. Um, so, uh, and sometimes it's hard to come by because there's an ash boring beetle that has destroyed a lot of the wood. Um, this is our faux spar that we've been using. You'll recognize it from some of the earlier um, lessons in, and I just want to show the fine uh, grain on this wood. This is an exceptional piece of wood. Um, I've got a little sterret ruler here and you can set the ruler down and if you start counting the growth rings you know you can see um, that we're way beyond my normal 10 or 12 per inch. It's, it's an exceptional piece of lumber. Um, very very fine grain, very slow growth. Um, this wood kind of wood is, is pretty hard to come by uh, and um, this was used uh, the whole piece was used to make the spars for our Curtis Jenny. Um, this is a piece of uh, spruce that I got deliberately. Um, you'll see um, it has a fine grain uh, for, for the growth, um, but it has some really, really obvious flaws. And this is some of the things you'll want to look for. Um, this huge gash is just bad handling at the uh, lumber mill. Uh, probably a forklift or something whacked it. Um, this is where there was at some time some kind of uh, branch or something else. And not only is it a, a flaw in this surface, but of course you can see it causes the, the grain to diverge. And you try to keep the grain um, as straight as possible. Um, it also has, on this side, I've circled it with a pencil uh, once again, where there was probably a branch or something uh, coming out of the tree at this point. And so you don't want these flaws that um, would mean that the structure isn't uh, perfectly sound throughout the wood. Now, would you have to condemn the whole piece of wood? Not at all. If you're making cap strip out of this and you band saw it and plane it to dimension, it would be just fine. It'd be perfect for that. Uh, you just want to be, you know, aware of these kind of uh, problems. Um, another thing uh, I'll say before we get too far is um, write down the species of the wood. You know, until you know them by heart um, and you're working in uh, uh, maybe not the greatest uh, amount of light in your shop, it's great to have just an S for spruce and an A for ash or whatever. So when you put the piece back up on your uh, uh, wood bench, uh, wood storage, you know exactly which one it is. 
Here's another piece of ash that we started uh, cutting and planing to make lawn jarons. And when we got into it, there was uh, some, some kind of flaw in the surface and a lot of grain that wasn't going straight. And then it had one of these little bores. And so this piece is pretty much uh, unusable. Um, the other thing I want to show, and the reason why I kept this piece to show people, um, when it was a big piece of wood and I was looking at it in the lumber yard, it had really fine grain. It was really nice. But what you see um, is, and I'm going to uh, illustrate it with this piece of string, is what we call diverging grain. Now, in a, in a perfect world, like on this uh, spar, we've got a, we could follow a grain line all the way down the wood, and it's, it's just uh, really nice and straight. But in, in this instance, we're using it as an example, we have some diversion in the grain. And so the grain is going uh, not perfectly straight like we'd like, but uh, diverging. And you want to avoid that because there's a chance that it would break along that uh, shorter distance. Less likely with the grain being nice and straight, but if it's diverging, uh, it's not acceptable. So this was just a reject that I kept uh, to show people. Um, this is a nice piece of, um, of um, ash. Um, it's got very good uh, fine grain. Um, we'll probably use it for some cross pieces um, in one of our airplanes or uh, some other kind of internal structure. Um, and and it, it doesn't have any flaws at all, actually. It's really quite good. So there's a good uh, example. Uh, in my discussion of the, the lumber, uh, he the, the heavy lumber, um, I mentioned some of the books that you're going to want to look into. Um, these books were published by the U.S. government uh, during World War II to kind of establish the very best standards for woodworking for aircraft. Um, the first one is called ANC-18. And it's a design of wood aircraft structures by the War Department. Um, it's an extraordinarily detailed book. Um, you know, you're really not necessarily going to have to read through it all or want to read through it. But it has very useful tables that compare the strengths and weights and measures of elasticity and all for other different species of wood and where they might be used. Um, it's very, very detailed. Uh, uh, lots of tables, but it has some very good uh, information. And this is available um, currently online and from our website. You can actually download it as a PDF. What's more difficult to come by um, is its sister publication, ANC-19. And this is wood uh, aircraft inspection and fabrication. And this would go uh, more to the lumber mill or the mill that was providing wood for uh, the construction of, of uh, World War II aircraft that contained wood. And once again, very, very detailed information about humidities and aircraft glues and um, doing laminations of wood. Um, there's a tremendous amount of valuable information. It gives examples, but it is very difficult to come by. Um, and we'll provide some of these pages uh, here in the video as still, so you'll be able to see them. So this is ANC-19. The other um, type of wood that you're going to use uh, over and over again in your shop, of course, is plywood. And I just have a couple examples here. I'm going to give you a couple ideas about ordering plywood. Um, this is a, a mahogany uh, veneer plywood that we use on leading edges. And you can see it's uh, stamped aircraft plywood ma manufacturing, and it's to mil spec. Um, you'll find there's a, a lot of very